So good morning, everyone. Um, this webinar is presented by the Minnesota Local Technical Assistance Program at the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. Minnesota LTAP is sponsored by the Minnesota Local Road Research Board and the Federal Highway Administration. LTAP is a program designed to provide local transportation agencies with tools for improving operations. LTAP's ultimate goal is to foster a safe, efficient, environmentally sound transportation system by improving skills and knowledge of local transportation providers through training, events, demonstrations, technical assistance, and technology transfer. Minnesota LTAP provides multiple training opportunities throughout the year, including annual events, technical workshops, and self-paced online courses. Visit, you can visit our training and events calendar for all upcoming opportunities. Minnesota LTAP has a variety of newsletters, reference documents, videos, a website, and provides library services and technical document searches. Minnesota LTAP provides, supports local agency innovations through two programs, Build a Better Mousetrap and Operational Research Assistance Program. Mousetrap is a state and national competition your entry can be anything from the development of tools or gadgets to equipment modifications to processes that increase safety, improve efficiency, reduce costs, or improve the quality of transportation. The purpose of this competition is to collect and disseminate real world examples of best practices, tips from the field, and assist in the transfer of technology. Opera provides funding to develop your ideas. Opera funds Projects up to $20,000 through a request for proposal process. Proposed projects should focus on the timely development of relevant ideas or methods that improve transportation or maintenance operations. And we just like to stop and recognize and congratulate the 2020 Rhodes Scholar graduates on this slide. And then, before I turn things over to Tom, I just want to give a short introduction to our instructor today. So Thomas Wood has worked in the pavement field for over 40 years. He has worked for MnDOT both in maintenance and asphalt research. He also worked for an asphalt supplier and consulting engineering firm. He is currently employed by Aztec Corp as a pavement specialist, helping customers with any pavement issues. Tom has a strong passion for keeping good roads lo good longer. He has been married for over 41 years with four children and 11 grandchildren and one great grandchild and another on the way. In his spare time, Tom enjoys tractor pulling, fishing and hunting. And then just real quick before Tom starts, um, just a quick note about Zoom. If you're unfamiliar, so we're in a meeting and we're asking that you keep your microphone muted while Tom speaks today. Um, he'll stop for questions, and if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, and I can catch them there. Video is completely optional, um, and if you have any technical problems, please reach out to me in chat as well. I'll be watching chat the entire meeting. Okay, Tom, I'm going to pass things off to you now. Okay, thanks, Claire, and good morning, everybody. Whoops. Sorry about that. Yeah, let's see. Whoops, where am I at? Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Claire, for the introduction. Uh, we're going to talk today about in-place asphalt recycling and rehabilitation. Uh, over the years, I've worked on a lot of things. I've worked on surface treatments. So I find them interesting. But the one area that really fascinated me and uh, uh, really think that uh, is underutilized is in-place recycling of our roads. and. Part of the reason why uh, it 
I'm really interested in it is the fact that as an agency, and I'll put my MnDOT hat back on, as an agency, we've already bought in that road. We own all that material. The more of it we reuse, the, the more cost effective it's going to be for the agency. So topics, we're going to talk about cold in place recycling and cold central plant. So if you, excuse me, if you see me or you hear me say CIR, I'm talking about cold in place recycling. If I talk about CCPR, that's cold central plant. We're going to talk about FDR and SFDR and FDR is full depth reclamation. SFDR is stabilized full depth reclamation. And then hot in place or HIR. So I'll try to use the full cold in place recycling, but sometimes you, you fall back into using acronyms and stuff. And so I just wanted to clarify that. We're gonna talk about benefits. What are they? Project selection and construction. So, so two minutes pavement rehab technology uh, techniques. So we've got, Overlay with two minutes, you know, complete removal, repave, uh, white topping with concrete, pre overlay treatments, milling overlay and milling inlay. And then there's recycling, it's hot in place recycling, cold in place recycling, which includes cold central plant and full depth reclamation. And of course, like I said, pavement reconstruction. So the current most common method of recycling bituminous pavements and asphalt or HMA is one of the most recycled materials in the world by tonnage. And it's the mill it, haul it, and recycle it at its plant. Uh, depending on the state and the agency, you can use up to 30%. So that means 70%. So if we're milling off three inches of bituminous and we're allowing them to use 30 percent or a third back we're having to put two inches of virgin material on there and there's a cost for using the virgin material plus there's a environmental cost in the fact that as we mine the aggregate and stuff we start to deplete our sources we have to go further away from the where we're at and all the, those costs so the other is, like I say, cold in place, CIR or CCPR, and it can be asphalt modified or, or lime cement, and then there's hot in place recycling. And then the final one that, that uh, I think needs to be used a lot more is full depth reclamation, whether it's just making black rock out of the road or stabilized, pulverized or stabilized. And I just got some pictures here. Here's a picture of a CIR train. Here's a picture of a cold central plant set up. Here's uh, of, uh, doing pre-grinding of a road for FDR. And I don't know whether it's stabilized or whether it's just a uh, pulverized road. And then here's a picture of a hot in place recycling train. So those are the four most common uh options right now so we're going to talk about them we're going to talk about why doing them well they're very cost effective uh nevada dot has re reported a savings of 20 million dollars a year for over the last 20 years using a blend of cir and fdr they mainly work on lower adt roads 400 adt and unders other states work on all levels of roads including the interstates uh been spending with my new job at Aztec. I've been calling on county engineers, been spending a lot of time down in Iowa, meeting county engineers, and it's been very interesting. I've learned a lot of stuff in Iowa, DOT does, and some of the counties have a lot of bituminous over old concrete roads and they're doing cold in place recycling very successfully of the bituminous over the concrete. And it's been pretty successful. The other advantage is it's limited user delays. It's environmentally acceptable. We're reusing 100% of the existing material on the road. You know, it's good for the environment. It's also very cost effective. It's less energy use, less greenhouse, 
gases, adds structure to the pavement, can use other surfacing methods fast and easy. Why do FDR, CIR, CCPR, or HIR? Like I said, it's environmentally acceptable. It reuses existing roadway materials, less energy, less greenhouse gases, adds structure. It, another thing it can do is it limits grade change, especially if you're just planning on doing an overlay. Uh, so many times people just think, well, I'm just gonna throw another two inches of mix on that road because it's all cracked up and it's starting to pothole. And they do that and they get their 10, 15 years out of it. And they come back and do it. And pretty soon their in slopes are getting so steep that it becomes a safety issue. So, and can be used with other surfacing methods. Uh, one of the counties here in the state of Minnesota about uh, two or three years ago, may, maybe four years ago, my memory's not so good, did a cold in place recycling project. And when they got done doing that four inches, they came back and they put micro surfacing on it and it's performing very well. And I've, I've helped some other counties in my MnDOT career that chip sealed their cold in place uh, recycled roadway. And their knees tend to be lower volume roads, but they've performed well. So we're gonna renew an old road. This road here, you can see a quarter there and see all those cracks. There's not much you can do to this road except either reconstruct it or do uh, in place recycling. My opinion, based off of having viewed this road, if you would do a uh, inch and a half mill and fill, that within a few years, all the cracks would come right back. Take care of areas like this. Here's a road that uh, is a good CIR candidate to me. It was it was in better shape. I probably would have looked at some other option before, but it was right on that border. And in that county is very aggressive about maintaining their roads. So it fell into their category for recycling. Remember the picture of the road with the quarter that I showed just with a few clicks back? Well, this is how that road looks when you're sitting in the truck. And when you first look at it, you go, oh, that's not terrible. I mean, it's not good, but it's not terrible. But then you get look up close and you see how bad. And one interesting area, especially with FDR and SFDR, is we can modify gravel roads to allow us to pave them with a thinner, hot mix surface to get the people out of the dust. So when are we going to recycle? Well, we're going to recycle at the pavement's end of its service life. We, know we want to get as much bang for the buck as we can out of the pavement. Some of the things that drive it are fatigue cracking, alligator cracking, severe oxidation. And to me, severe oxidation doesn't drive it as much as the cracking, whether it's fatigue cracking or thermal cracking and potholes. They're, the other advantage of doing cold in place recycling is you can keep your elevation down, like I said, so your in slopes don't get so steep. And so if you have any overhead, uh, like bridges or anything that you gotta go under, you can maintain your clearance. So so now, right now, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about some of the common additives for uh, the cold side of the business. And that's uh, cold in place recycling, cold central plant and full depth reclamation because they use a lot of the same additives. The hot in place recycling, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview because I'm not that, uh, that experienced on it. Uh, I've got quite a bit of experience with the, the cold side of the business because when I worked for Coke Materials Company, we did a lot of work with that. So I've, I've got there, there, which reminds me, I almost forgot the Asphalt Research the Recycling Association, AARA, has an excellent book called The Biome, The Basic Asphalt Recycling Manual. Uh, Get a hold of one of your uh, contractors that that belongs to look on their website and find out a contractor around if you want some information on in play and uh, recycling and get a hold of them and have them get the con member contractor get you a copy of it. It's, it's an excellent book. It's uh, 
I've got it downstairs in my office right on the shelf and I use it to look up a lot of stuff. So it's an excellent book. So there. So we have, first we have foamed or expanded asphalt for any Canadians that are listening. Then we have emulsions and it can be a CSS1 or CSS1H if it's not engineered. And I, in this climate, <coughs> excuse me, I would not recommend using a 1H because CSS1 is a softer base asphalt than CSS1H. CSS1H, if I remember right, the penetration range is 40 to 90 pen. So if we were PG grading that, which I know we don't PG grade emulsions yet, would probably PG grade a minus 22, which is, uh, or maybe a minus 16, which would be prone to cracking. Uh, some places they use high float medium set two or HF MS 2S. And then there's engineered emulsions. And I think, uh, on the emulsion side of the business, we're seeing more and more work go to engineered emulsions. And these are emulsions that are specifically designed to work in in-place recycling. And they they don't totally rely on a uh, uh, environmental curing. They rely more uh, a mix of chemical and, and environmental. And then there's dry additives, there's cement, Lime, hydrated lime, fly ash, when we used to be able to get fly ash, uh, worked really well. And then mag chlorides and calcium chlorides. And then there's other proprietary products, which I haven't got a lot of experience with. So, so I'll tell you that right up front. And then there's foam. That, uh, so we're going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each one. So the strengths of foam asphalt or expanded asphalt is early strengths. Uh, they claim you can overlay it earlier. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not totally convinced on that there. Uh, it adds new asphalt to the pavement. And what we're trying to do when we do in-place recycling, we're trying to take an old pavement and we're trying to add the proper amount of new asphalt in it to restore the, the uh, crack resistance but yet not add so much asphalt that we make it prone to rutting. And that applies whether it's emulsion or uh, foamed or expanded asphalt. They claim you can work later in the season. This is right out of the barn. Uh, I'll go back to my days working in the Office of Road uh, Materials and Road Research in the Asphalt Research section. Uh, most of the roads that this time of year, the districts or the counties would call me out the new pavements to look at were pavements that were paved late October, November. I'm not a big fan of working later in the season. They say it's a strength. Now we can work up to Christmas. I'm not so sure about that. Weaknesses. The biggest issue, and uh, I have had with foamed asphalt is in order to foam it, you have to have the asphalt binder hot enough that when you inject water into it, it turns to foam. And the idea is what we're doing there is if you just sprayed straight hot liquid asphalt into your recycling pug mill or into the reclaimer there or this cold central plant, it would ball up because the aggregate and the millings are all damp, uh, cold, cool and they can be damp. And so it wouldn't uniformly disperse. So I'll go back to when I do my surface treatment classes. There's at room temperature, liquid asphalt binder is a semi-liquid. You can actually take a little metal tin and fill it full of asphalt binder and let it cool to room temperature and if you turn the binder or the little tin on its side and over time it'll slowly creep out it's really not usable so there's three ways to make it usable we can heat it up and what we're doing when we heat it up hot is we're lowering the viscosity so it flows 
we can um, cut it with diesel fuel or gasoline. That's your cutbacks, emulsions, and, by, and you still have to heat it some, but not as hot because now we've we put a cutter or a uh, 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 thinning agent in it. It's like thinning paint to get it to flow, or we can emulsify it. But at the end of the day, what's important is we get the right amount of asphalt in there. So on a foam to asphalt, depending on what great asphalt you're using, it might have to be 300 to 320 degrees F. So you're going down the road with a cold in place recycling plant, pulling it down the road, you're pulling a tanker with uh, hoses and everything around it. And I'm just scared somebody's going to get burnt. I'm just scared. And their uh, safety is big on my point. So my personal opinion is I think there can be some safety issues. I think with proper setup and, and procedures, you can minimize that. But, you know, 300 degree asphalt binder gets on you, it's going to burn you seriously. On the, when we use emulsions, they're at room temperature, 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 degrees. It may make a mess, but it's not going to burn you. Yeah, 280 and higher. Needs to have the proper amount of fines in order to coat. If it doesn't have enough fines, it'll clump up. You may have to, if you're doing a project and it's not working right, you may have to add some fines to make it work properly. The big issue, and then over the time they've converted me, this used to be a huge issue to me, but now I've sort of watched roads that have been recycled with foamed asphalt and they're performing fine. So it's not as big an issue as it used to be. But when you run, whether it's SFDR or CIR or cold central plant, and I don't see much uh, foamed asphalt being used on cold central plant because it, the amount of time you have to place it is limited. Uh, you'll notice that it doesn't coat all the wrap. It does a real good job of coating the fines, but it leaves the bigger chunks of wrap uncoated. And I was a little concerned about that. And I used to say, well, if you ran uh, recycle through a hot mix plant at 20% or 30%, and if you were getting chunks of uh, recycled hot mix, you know, new mix out of a hot mix plant that had chunks of wrap that weren't coated, I would have been concerned about that. And the, the other the people that I was working with, oh, it's not that big an issue. It's not that big an issue. And like I say, over the time, I'm modifying my how big an issue it is to me. Emulsion, strength, it adds new asphalt to the wrap. It gives a uniform coating of the wrap, gives whole pavements more flexibility back to what I said before. We're trying to get the right amount of new asphalt into an old pavement to maintain or restore the flexibility while balancing the st stability. It's safer, it's done at room temperature or ambient temperature. It uses less energy. Weaknesses, they say, can be slower to build strength. My experience on a good engineered emulsion system is if if you have the proper compactive effort, it'll build strength fast, fast, uh, almost as fast as the foamed asphalt. I literally, in my Coke materials day, did SFDR projects where we injected them one day in, late in the year and we paved them the next day and they performed fine. Uh, they delay putting the surface on until the water level is 2% or less, and that's uh, there. And where the problem comes in is we've had rain here in Maple Grove from up until yesterday. Well, I think it might even sprinkle yesterday morning. I guarantee you there's more than 2% moisture in the, in the roadway right now. So getting the roadway drier than what it started out with can be an issue. So I'm big on compaction, compaction, compaction. When you get 95% of modified proctor, you're good to go. And, uh, and the way I justify that is if, if I'm putting gravel out, base gravel out, I try to get meet the spec of uh, maximum density at optimum moisture. And so if optimum moisture on a, 
uh, a gravel I'm using is five and a half percent, six percent, four and a half percent. Do I wait on the road to dry out to under two percent before I pave on it? No. So to me, it's all about compactive effort. They claim a shorter working season. I, to me, if I was uh, in charge, there would be paving season would be a lot shorter because I see a lot more raveling. I see a lot more stripping. I see a lot more over my career issues with HMA pavements that were paved late October, November, and even into December. In fact, I'm watching a, a, a commercial parking lot not too far from where I lived. It was paved when it was snowing in December last year. It's going to be fun to watch how that works out. Dry additives, strength, early strength. If you use cement, fly ash, or lime, you can get phenomenal strengths early. Pave in a day or two. Extra stiffness. will work with a wide range of materials. And some of the materials that we're using were waste products, like when fly ash used to be available. But now most of the fly ash goes to the concrete industry, which uh, they use. It, so Weaknesses. It can be too stiff. If you're using cement, you need to stay with uh, your seven-day strength on stabilized full depth reclamation. It needs to be under 300 PSI and seven days and i'm guessing you need to be in the same range with cir if you get it too stiff it's going to crack you're going to get a crack pattern that's uh hard to get out i've seen on some stabilized full depth reclamation projects where they were going to put a chip seal on it on a hot day they were grinding in the cement and they were compacting it and they were having trouble getting it bladed smooth before the cement sat up so much that they couldn't handle it. So, so an old maintenance person, and the old saying in there, if a little's good, a lot is better. No, it's not. You need to do a good design on your additive with the material you're using so that you don't get it too strong. We're just trying to bind it. We're not trying to make it like concrete panels. I don't think leaching is a big issue, but you always got to be concerned with that. So, so we'll first talk about, the, well, first of all, Claire, is there any questions? Must put everybody to sleep. Okay, first we'll talk about cold in place recycling. And I, this is a picture I've got of a train. So if you look up here, where's my mouse? Up here is a water tanker. Here's a 12, 12 and a half foot mill. It feeds into a uh, screening, crushing, mixing plant, drops the material in a windrow. And I believe this is a foamed asphalt job. So this is a hot flat tank with 300, three, 280, 300 degree uh, asphalt binder in it. And then back behind here is a paver. Once you pave it, you hit it with rollers, combination of rubber tired rollers and steel rollers. Uh, depends on the contractor. Some will break down with rubber tired rollers. Some will break down with steel roller. The goal is to meet the specifications there and, and get good compaction. And this is what we're trying to end up with, with a nice looking road. So, so I'm gonna go and thank Workin for this train, this diagram of, shows what that picture I showed before, but here's a material additive. So this is a dry system here. They're putting cement or lime or fly ash in it. They got a milling machine. They say 250 millimeters, 380, uh, 3,800 there. Depth from, so to me, they're 12, 12 and a half foot wide. Depth up to four inches. You do need to leave if you're doing cold in place recycling, you need to leave a half an inch and an inch of the existing pavement to carry the train. Feed it into the machine. There's a screen deck here. Any oversized material goes down to a hammer mill or a 
crusher. It's recrushed and run back up over the screens. The material that's the proper size falls onto a belt, comes up weigh scale, weighed, and computer meters in the additives, whether it's a liquid system like emulsion or foamed asphalt, or it's a dry system like a, a cement or lime. Uh, windrows dropped on the ground, picked up with a pickup machine, ran into a paver, compacting this uh, working, it's got a soil compacting roller here, but a double drum steel roller or and a combination of rubber tired rollers. They are now building single unit, whoops, back up, single unit working, builds a single unit set up worth a mill, it does all the sizing and stuff. Uh, if the road isn't rutted, because they work off volume, they, they don't work off weight, or I believe they don't work off of weight. If the road is uniform across, or if you've done, let's say you got eight inches of hot mix out there and you went in and you milled off three inches of hot mix, took that to the hot mix plant. You're gonna recycle four inches and leave an inch there. And even if the road was rutted, but you milled off the rutted area, so you got a flat one, they'll work. I just, I have some concerns. Uh, they claim they can do very good work and uh, I'm willing to sit back and watch. Here's just another picture of, a, of that overhead. It's just, these drone pictures are just phenomenal. I wish we'd had them. 20 years ago when I first started working on doing presentations. But but here you can see they're going along and they're milling it up and laying it down. You can see this is, must be an emulsion process because it's brown and it's going to turn black. And here's just another picture. Whoops, let's back up. One interesting thing, and I'm going to stress this on CIR, is you can use your cold in place recycling pass as a pass that can help improve your ride. So in other words, let's say we're doing a CIR and we're gonna put two inch and a half lifts of hot mix on it. So we get two paving passes with the paver to improve ride. Well, if you put a long ski on the milling machine, you can start to smooth out the road and you start to take dips out there. And then if you run a long ski on the paver, you can also, so now instead of two opportunities to improve ride, you can have three or four. This is a project I did back in 2004 and uh, just another, they're an emulsion job. We went up, we went up in the morning and we turned around, we're coming back and we're carrying live traffic on the, on the, this side already. And up here, a ways is a gravel pit and they had belly dumps running now. Well, we did talk to the people hauling gravel and we got them, we got them to uh, stagger so they didn't drive exactly in the same place all the time. So they helped us with the compaction. Uh, uses for CIR is if you got a very wide road, here's a road that's wider than a what the 12 foot mill can handle. So they're milling one pass with additional mill and they're windrowing the material here. And then the CIR train will come here and pick it up and they'll repave it back out the full width. Back to ride, here's what the back end looks like with the, with the uh, paver. And you notice they're running a long ski and you'll see that there's quite a bit of fluff there. And I, I think on four inches, you're gonna gain after compaction, half an inch, maybe three eighths of an inch, maybe a little more depending on the gradation. Back to that picture hitting with a rubber, come on, with a rubber tired roller. Uh, compactive effort is very critical on uh, successful in place recycling. Environmental benefits, no heat used. Uh, reduces fossil fuels, no trucking, less pollution. 100% of the aggregate and asphalt is reused or recycled. Uh, the need for virgin aggregate and asphalt binder is reduced or eliminated. 
Uh, studies show 40 to 50% savings can be achieved versus a conventional uh, mill, haul to the plant, recycle through the plant and haul back. So good candidates include pavements with at least four inches of HMA. You need to have a little bit to carry that train. Uh, needs adequate base and sub base. Uh, if you don't have adequate base or sub base, when that 12 foot mill or 12 and a half foot mill goes by, it's real heavy. But then when you're pulling that recycling plant, the crusher screening plant, that thing is real heavy. And that's usually what ends up bogging down. And once you get one of them stuck, it's a mess. Uh, so really distressed payments are a good candidate. Poor candidates include payments with inadequate base or sub base or inadequate drainage. Uh, Pavement fabrics can cause big issues. Uh, if you're an agency and you think or you know there's pavement fabrics out there, I would strongly recommend that you put in your notes in the bid proposal package that there's pavement fabrics present or could be present so that the contractor can bid it accordingly because otherwise you're going to run into a situation of of change conditions and uh, could be claims. Fundamental of the CIR, analyze existing structure and conditions, understand what causes the stresses, correct any drainage or base problems if possible. Many options, emulsion, foam to asphalt, cement, there. So the current state of art and uh, and I know there's been a committee I used to be on it when I was still working MnDOT that was working on uh, a mixed design process. There are several mixed design processes out there that are good, but just getting one that's adopted uh, across the board, you know, nationwide, that's that's hard to do. Uh, rule of thumb without a mixed design is they're going to put one and a half, two percent emulsion in. Uh, so if it's 60% asphalt and the emulsion, you're looking at, you're adding at 2%, you're adding 1.2% asphalt. If you're doing foam, they usually foam it at 2% asphalt. So over here in the emulsion, I'm at one, two, and over here I'm in the foam, I'm at two. And I'm wondering about uh, performance. Hmm. I think the, the emulsion needs to be up close to three, but then that's just my opinion. Dry additives, two to 6%. Need quality control requirements. To me, you need to run at least two gradations a day and you need to construct a control strip for your rolling and compacting effort. And if you see the gradation changing, it goes in the morning, it's coarse, and you set up your rolling pattern in the afternoon when it gets hot, it becomes finer because the millings are milling finer. You need to reestablish your uh, rolling control strip. To me, some of the things that have been working on, and I, and I apologize, I haven't in the last year or two, I haven't uh, spent a lot of time reading to see where they're at. On that, I've been busy doing other things. You need to design a defined sampling protocol for the mixed design. I there is, like I say, the I, my bias is I work for Coke Materials. We developed a mixed design process that worked very well. Uh, takes a lot of material. It takes sixty six inch cores, six inch diameter, four inches high to do a cold in place recycling design. Performance related specs, that's the ultimate goal. They're still work trying to work on performance based specs for a hot mix asphalt. Ideally in a perfect world, as an agency, you would tell the contracting uh, industry, I want the road to be able to carry this many easels a year for this many years. Uh, you're not allowed more than this many cracks, blah, no, this much rutting, blah, blah, blah. And everything's performance-based. And then you let them design it. 
but we're a long ways away from that. A defined QCQA plan, uh, structural ratings, that's an area where more research needs to be done. I'm not sure, I think MnDOT gives uh, cold in place recycling, uh, uh, gravel equivalents of 1.5. Uh, I know they give that for SFDR and based off of test sections that I've been involved with in my days at MnDOT, that's very conservative. That's very conservative. I honestly believe that at some point in time, somebody's going to be able to come up with a additive package for the asphalt binder that you're going to be able to inject the proper amount into the wrap, uniformly coat it. You're going to be able to rejuvenate the old binder and you're going to be able to recompact it to where it would, should be equal to structurally the strength that it was when it was first paid. We're not there yet, but we're getting a lot closer. The rejuvenators and stuff that the people are working on to allow them to use more wrap through a hot mix plant. They're making some real good headway. And I, I see it coming over to the cold side of the business. And when we get there, uh, then all of a sudden, if you got a road out there and let's say it's 400 ADT and less than 5% trucks. Uh, so uh, 200,000 easels, life payment or whatever it is. And you got five inches of bid out there that was been down for 30 years. You come in, you recycle four inches of it, put it back down, put a surface on it like a chip seal, just to waterproof it or microsurfacing. And you go down the road and get similar performance. They will get to that point. I'm hoping it, it happens sooner than later. And the other thing is, if you're doing CIR with the mill uh, and paving, put a ride spec in there. Take, an, uh, take advantage of the opportunity of the cold in place pass to improve the ride. And remember, the more you do, the less unknowns you have, the better chance for success you have. So the recommended mix design, uh, this is based off of the one that Coke Materials developed. You need to analyze the wrap. It's very important. You need to determine the following, the amount of fines available, the amount of asphalt in the wrap. Field cores are crushed into three gradations, bands. You crush a fine, a coarse, and an intermediate. And the idea is you do designs for two of those three, usually the coarse and the, inner, and the fine, and then you can plot it and that way, wherever you, when you do your field gradation, wherever it matches up, you can get a pretty good idea of what you need. Need to know how thick the pavement is. And like I say, the coarse and fine gradations, the designs are made for the two gradations, coarse and fine, and this allows for field adjustments. Site selection there, mixed design, these are things that components of a well-engineered CIR program. So you need to make sure that the roadway that you're picking is a good candidate for it. Uh, you got one where the cattails are growing right up the edge of the road and the fish are swimming alongside the road. It's probably not a good CIR candidate. You need to have a mixed design and performance testing. And then... It's recommended to the contractors, employees, and the DOT people are trained on how to inspect it. So often what happens in an agency is they may, may be the first CIR job they've ever done, or they may have, a, if, at MnDOT, they'd have a lot of big projects going, and so they'd send their experienced uh, inspectors to the... Uh, big jobs and the, the new person that never been around it, they'd send them out to inspect, whether it's chip seal, micro, these recycling jobs and stuff. And so they need to have proper training and that needs to be a partnership between the industry and the agencies. So key to building a good CIR project, proper project selection, field evaluation, cores, as-built, test pits, 
FWD full depth, FWD soil borings is a pavement uniform thickness. It doesn't do you much good to do a design. And if you take all your samples for your mixed design at one place and there's five inches of bit there. And so you're gonna CIR four and you go a half mile down the road and there's only three and a half inches of bit there. Now you've got to, you got to make some adjustments. Mixed design with the wrap from the project. If the surface change, you might have to do more than one mixed design. Back in my Coke days, we went down to Iowa with joint project between two counties and uh, is cold in January and we knew we had to take 60 cores. When we got down there and we found out County A didn't chip seal and County B did. And they're having a joint project that runs across the county line. So guess what? The 60 cores, we had to take 120 because we had to do a design for each one. You need to document any surface treatments. Is there chip seal there? Is there crack sealing or others? Especially if you want to document a route and seal. Uh, the, well, you want to document all of them, but a route and seal, you want to make sure you put it in the field notes on your plans or wherever you put the notes that it's been routed and sealed and there is crack sealant there because sometimes those ropes will wrap up on the machine and the contractor doesn't take risks, they price risk. So, and then you need to estimate the current and future easels. You need to realistically understand what this road is going to carry in the future. Then you need to design the surface course, HMA. So you go to the expense of doing the in-place recycling, you know, four inches there. Use a proper PG binder so that the, because you made the cold in place material flexible to where it's not prone to cracking. Don't put a prone to cracking uh, hot mix over top of it. And then you can put a chip seal or micro. Like I say, there's a county here in, in Minnesota that did a project where they microed it and they saved lots of money by micro instead of putting overlay. But there again, they had plenty of structure. I don't remember how thick the pavement was, but after they CIR'd the four, top four inches, and even with a GE of 1.5 in the existing, they had more than enough strength for the anticipated traffic on the road. And talking, this was, I was working at WSB at that time, talking to the county engineer, and he said, well, I saved this much a mile, he said, if I have to come back in two or three years, if it starts to rut, I can micro and re-level it out. So construction issues, watch the depth of cut, establish rolling fabric, re-establish rolling pattern if there's changes on the grade, check gradations, check cross slope. They can to a point change the cross slope. If you've got a one five and you wanna make it a two, they can do, they can help you toward that too, but they probably, depending on how deep you're going, probably can't get the full two because they've only got so much, they got to, they pave what they pick up. Compaction, compaction, compaction. I've, if I've seen issues with in-place recycling, it's lack of good compactive effort. And then I'm a strong believer after you've done the CIR and it's been open to traffic for a day or two, if you're not going to pave it right away, or even if you are going to pave it, fog seal it. And it helps uh, prevent raveling and it also acts like a tack for when we put the hot mix on it. And for sure, tack it before the first lift of HMA. And if you're using a chip seal, you need to be careful on your emulsion shot rate for the chip seal because it's a softer surface. You're going to push the rock down into the surface somewhat. So just, and I'm going over the same things, but these are key things there. And they always tell you, you got you to gotta tell somebody something three times. You tell them what you're going to tell them. You tell them, and then you tell them what you're told. Um, so... Back and I thank work and once again the road tech check the depth and cross slope at least once every hour. 
Here on the screening plant, calibrate additive meters, make sure that the belt scale is calibrated and everything is putting the right amount of material in because you want the all expense of doing a mix design and designing the deal. And if your belt scale is off or your uh, metering system's not working right, you really don't know what you're doing. No holes in the screen deck or paving fabrics. If you get into paving fabrics, a lot of times they'll cover the deck up and the contractor will have to have people stand up there picking the fabric off the deck. Check pug mill paddles for wear on the emulsion when it gets hot and they always complain about it getting sticky and too hard to work with. The contractor will say that in the pug mill. Usually it's because the paddles in the pug mill are wearing down. And the best analogy I can give you is if you got a concrete driveway or you got a uh, bunch of ply, big sheets of plywood down, and you dump a bunch of inch and a half landscape rock on it. And if you take a shovel and you try to push the shovel into the rock, you know, five inches off the ground, it's really hard to push it in there. But if you take that shovel, and you scrape it along the concrete driveway or along the plywood, it slides underneath the rock better. And that's on a pug mill. And it doesn't matter whether it's the cold in place recycling train or a cold central plant or on a pug mill on a micro machine. As long as those pug mill paddles are wiping the barrel of the pug mill clean, it takes less energy. But if they're trying to cut through the material, it takes a lot more energy. Keep the paving train close. I always used to joke when I inspected these jobs, they ought to have a log chain tied to the between the uh, processing plant and the paver. And it's my understanding some of the uh, single train units, they do basically have them connected. So brought this up once before but here's just a picture they're using a long ski to improve ride if i was a paving contractor and i was doing a traditional mill and overlay and there was ride benefit i would require the milling contractor to use some sort of a uh leveling device on the mill so i can get credit he can help me with the or she can help me with the uh leveling or smoothing the road Long ski, the contractor that's there again on the other side of the mill. Here's a 40 foot ski on the paver. Ah, uh, there. Other uses, I talked about a wide road doing it all in one pass. Here's a case where a project I was on where we widened 11 foot lanes to 13 feet. So we went along with a little, little mill and picked up some of the gravel along the edge of the road. Now, when we did the mix design on this road, we knew that we were going to widen it. So we took samples of the gravel from the shoulders and proportioned that into the wrap that we had crushed off the cores on the main line and came up with the amount of emulsion there. So here's just a picture of the trains getting ready to turn around, but you can see the mill, the little mills picking the gravel up and laying on the road and the big mills. Oops, that's right. You can't see my fingers. The big mill is uh, milling up there and picking up the gravel and laying the material out underneath. Here's just another picture. And this is what it looks like. And this is after one lane has been compacted, 11 foot lane, 13 foot lane. It's a good option if you got plenty of shoulder and you got good gravel on there. And so this is what we, Took that same road. This is when we're out corn and getting ready to do the mix designs. And there's what we ended up with when we got done. And of course, then they put three inches of hot mix over top of it. And that was done in oh, 2003 or 2004. And I drove it about a year or so ago and it's performing well. So, is there any questions? Claire, or everybody hear me? There's no questions in the chat. Okay. Okay, well, why don't we take a, a five minute break
right now because uh, they're because we've been going an hour and I need to pick up the pace or we're going to be here all day. So, but so see everybody back at 8 30. Okay, let's get started again. Uh, cold central plant, CCPR. Uh, basically, it's uh, just a, they take the resizing plant, the screening plant, the pug mill out of a CIR train. They set it up in a stockpile and they're in. So why? Well, a lot of places in the country, especially if you get away from major cities, has a surplus of wrap. Because like I say, if you use 30% in the mix, 70% in 
either gets used for shouldering material or commercial work, but if you don't have enough commercial work or shouldering work, it ends up there. Uh, so it allows you to reuse your stockpile. They run it through their processing plant off a CIR train or some contractors have dedicated uh, plants for cold central plant. Uh, place with traditional paver. Uh, discussion with a contractor that does a lot of this work. They like to pave it in four inch lifts. I think you ought to pave it, if you're putting four inches down, you ought to pave it in two two inch lifts so that uh, it's easier to get density. It allows you to work in tighter areas because that CIR train, you know, time you got a water tanker out in front of the mill, you got a mill, you got the resizing plant, uh, you got a frat tank for the emulsion or for the foam to asphalt or for the uh, uh, cement, you're probably a couple hundred feet long. You know, so it's hard to do in residential areas. It's hard to do in uh, parking lots and stuff. So there. So where do I see this really growing? I see this growing out in Western Dakotas where a lot of little cities, the only time they see a hot mix plant come into town is when the state repaves the state highway, which is maybe every 20 years. So it's an opportunity. So Tom, we have reclamation. A Tom, sorry, we have a couple of questions in the chat. If you're, do you want me to go ahead and ask them? Yep, yep. Okay, so Kevin asked, if the old pavement has extensive alligator cracking, this makes it difficult to FDR because the chunks slide around and do not grind well. Does the CIR train do a better job in these conditions? Yes, they do, because on a CIR train, the mill picks them up and they may come up with chunks. It goes up the belt. It goes over a screen deck. And, I, and it depends on the state. I think Minnesota is a, the, the material has to be an inch and a half or smaller. I believe that's MnDOT spec. I haven't read it in years. And they oversized material goes down into a hammer mill and is recrushed and ran back up over the, over the screen deck. So yeah, yeah, if it's really alligated, uh, full depth reclamation, we can talk about it. It's a little tougher to do, but there's things you can do, so. Then the second question, Claire. Yes, the second question from Andrew is, I have heard in the past that there is a recommended minimum length to make a CIR project economical. I have heard three or four miles in length. Is this true and what are your thoughts on this? Uh, Andrew, I'm, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but to me that seems logical because if you've got a train, time you get to the rollers and everything there, you got a train that's, thousand feet long you know there and and i could see three to four miles because uh uh the one contractor that i used to work a lot with they could do up to well their record i think was five lane miles in a day so they to move in and stuff they need to have a day or two's worth of work so that seems realistic there and that may be a case where a cold central plant may make more sense Okay, we'll go to full depth reclamation. And the one question about chunks was there, they can be harder to do. If you'll see here in this picture, and it's just, uh, I just would grab them pictures when I updated the presentation. And this is actually out at Men Road. You see all those chunks laying there and there, there we went through and we ripped out, uh, we saw a cut two foot wide down the center of this cell because we knew we had a water problem. We chunked it out with a uh, bobcat with a backhoe, laid it on the pavement, and then we went in and put a drain tile in. And then we pushed the material back there. We were able to crush them up, but the contractor had to slow down and there's a crusher bar. They got to make sure they got that set right. So if you do an FDR project, read the, I think it's 2215 spec. And if you know it's an alligator road, highlight the areas in your proposal saying we expect not to exceed a certain size. And they may have to, uh, they may have to pulverize it and come back and repulverize it to get to meet gradation. But the second pass doesn't take very long. So, 
So here's just a picture of a full depth operation where they're pre-grinding the road with three reclaimers and they're lightly compacting it. So what is full depth? It's the full thickness of the asphalt pavement and a predetermined portion of the base sub-base. Our subgrain is uniformly pulverized, blended to provide a harmonious, homogeneous material. If new material is not sufficient base for the new surface course, the reclaimed material can be stabilized by mechanical, chemical, or bituminous means. So this is basically from federal highways. Completely breaks up the crack pattern. Can increase the structural rating of the road. So, and here is some pictures. We take an old road up here and with water coming in it. And we, here's the stabilized one. So they stabilize six to 10 inches over the granular base and recycle. So to me, there's two options. There's grind the HMA and the base and recompact. And that's just normal in MnDOT's uh, speak, that's normal FDR. And the ratio they normally is 50 to 50 wrapped to granular because MnDOT's position when I was working there was they want it to be more like a gravel. So it's easy to blade and shape. If you had, uh, let's say you had a county road that you had six inches of bit on it that was all cracked up and you had five inches of gravel over uh, native soil and you did not want to get into the clay because you don't want to bring clay in there, I would tell you do six inches with four inches of the gravel. It's going to be a little harder to grade, but the the people doing the shaping with the motor graders and stuff can run uh, seg uh, serrated cutting edges on their cutting uh, on their mold boards on their graders. They MnDOT spec wants the residual asphalt under three percent, and then there's grind the HMA base and stabilize, and the ratio there again can be from 50-50 to I've done them when I worked for Coke Materials up to 100 percent wrap. So we go back to that same county road where we got six inches of bit over five inches of gravel and I want to stabilize it, but I don't, but I want to go to stabilize six inches of roads. All I need to stabilize it one, a G 1.5. So what I would do there is I would grind six inches of the, all the HMA into one inch of the gravel just to keep the teeth cool. And then I would stabilize the top six inches. And if you go 50-50, you have to add X amount of emulsion or foamed asphalt to meet the stability requirements. If you go 90-10, the amount of emulsion or foamed asphalt you have to put in goes down dramatically to meet the same criteria. So you end up saving yourself money and getting the same process. So why stabilize? The Montreal Ministry of Transportation has found the following. Between stabilized and unstabilized, similar product uh, performance. And the Becky Lane used to do a presentation on that. And I seen her deal about five years ago. And, she, and, and at year 15, they thought the performance was similar. And then I seen her about five years ago, and she said that uh, now that they're getting out 20, 25 years, the stabilized FDR is way outperforming the uh, unstabilized. But they use a lighter thickness overlay on the stabilized. So unstabilized, they put two 50 millimeter lifts of HMA on. On the stabilized, they put one. So even if at 20 years, they were getting the same performance between stabilized and unstabilized, they're using half the HMA. So they're quite a cost saving. But now they're getting the test sections about out long enough that they're getting toward the end of their life, that they're seeing a dramatic improvement over on the stabilized, even though it's got half as much HMA on it versus the unstabilized. To me, stabilized full depth reclamation is a tool that's way underutilized. Because it allows you to build the strength down into your pavement so that you keep your 
in slopes from getting too steep. It, it helps you with elevation and there's a lot of benefits. Mechanical stabilized, that's just pulverizing. And like I say, we talked about these additives before. So the construction process, pulverize and blade and lightly compact before that before you do a stabilized FDR. Add material, it aids in material sizing if additives would be added later. And back to that question, if you have a lot of chunks and they're not meeting the three inch minus, I believe in that spec is three inch minus, make them either slow down or make them regrind it until they do meet it. It allows you after you pre shape uh, there the correct there and i'm talking about stabilized fdr it allows you to correct the profile if needed there and you can adjust the moisture reclaim and mix additives as applicable to six to ten inches in place with a reclaimer or we actually had at min dot we had a uh, sfdr project where the contractor came in with his reclaimers and ground it and pre-shaped it and then he brought in his cir train just the the milling machine and the processing plant and he did the injection with that and the reason why he did it because trucks were short for hauling liquid the emulsion there and this way he was able to pull a frat tank and he and instead of having to make four passes to do a 24 foot lane because you got overlap he was able to do it in two 12 and a half foot passes and it turned out really well. So here's just a fit of, a, of a doing an injection there. Tom, we so have another the, question. Yep, yep. So Anthony asked if we need to maintain grade and mill off bit before SFDR and have three inch bit to grind into eight inch aggregate, will that be a problem? No, it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, Andrew, is this a curb and gutter section? I'm assuming it is. If you're milling three off for your grade, uh, depending on who you work for and what you have available. When I was at uh, WSB, we had one city that did a lot of FDR in their curb and gutter area, and they would do the their, they ran three and a half, four inches of bed and uh, three and a half, four inches of gravel and then after they ground it off then they uh, um, pulverized it they would come in and have the contractor pick up the three inches of the material surplus material and put it in their stockpile the city stockpile site and then when a developer would come in to build a new uh, subdivision in there the city would sell them that material to the developer to use underneath the street and it was a win-win for the city number one they got some money for the material they already owned and number two is that new street that in the development that was going to become a city street they knew what type of material was going underneath it so that answer your question i hope yeah back to that 50 50 blend that's the max that mendot says you should have wrapped the asphalt uh you could go 90% gravel and 10% wrap and it wouldn't be a problem. It just you just treat it like a gravel base. Thank you for the info. You bet. Uh you need to do pavement material assessment, you need an engineered mixed design. I know that uh Braun and AET here in the Minnesota do the mixed designs, get a hold of those guys to find uh, gals to find out how much material you need. And then you need to pick the correct additive for the application. I know that uh, the contractor's pictures I got shown here, they do not, last time I talked to them, and I could be wrong, but last time we talked about it, they do not do foam to asphalt on stabilized FDR because of just the, you know, you're hooking up material, uh, uh, trailers and stuff. They use mainly emulsion. Uh, performance related specs. Construction guidelines and QC specs. And you're going to see that we spent a lot of time on CIR. And I did that for a reason because a lot of the things 
from CIR carry over to SFDR. So you need to do payment material assessment, springtime, preferably structural evaluation by agency or consulting engineer. You need to determine the structure layer evaluation, uh, drainage, distresses, road needs. So often people underestimate what the future is gonna bring on the road and that causes problems. Keys to success, pavement and material assessment, soil boring, samples top six to 10 inches, at least however far, whether you're doing FDR or SFDR, that you're gonna work, you need to at least be that deep, if not a little deeper. They talk about arguing to five feet to look for water, layer thickness and pavement, the soil layers and types to get you your R value so you can do your design and then location of water table. They talk about doing strength testing to identify weak areas and, and determine subgrades uh, there. So falling weight deflometer, FDR, California bearing ratio or R value, comb, dynamic comb pentrometer. Whoops. Proof roller on gravel road. Uh, I'm working with some townships right here this late winter. They want to chip seal gravel roads. And I'm telling them load up their snow plow truck with gravel when the roads start to thaw and drive over them and find a soft spot. I'm a big, on a granular surface, proof rolling is probably one of the best tools because you can test the whole road. Compaction, we start with a pad foot roller. We roll with the pad foot roller back and forth until it walks out. So if you stand in front of the pad foot roller, vibratory pad foot roller, you should be able to see daylight between the pads. Usually on an emulsion stabilized one, that's about three or four passes. Uh, blade de desired profile to fill the pads. An interesting story, MnDOT was doing a, uh, Metro was doing a, stabilized FDR job out on Highway 5 out by Victoria. And they asked me, well, I was still at the lab, they asked me to come out and help the inspectors. The road had been pre-ground, reshaped, lightly compacted. Now they're doing the injection. Very experienced contractors is the sub doing the injection. They start pushing the tankers down the road, putting the oil in and injecting it. Pad foot roller, Vibratory pad foot roller starts rolling back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it wasn't coming out of it. And I told the state inspectors, you know, cause I'm working for the state. And I said, well, they just got to get that motor grader out there and start to fill the pocket marks in. So when the pad foot goes forward, the blade ought to be following it up. And when they come back that way, you're building on top. Cause what was happening, they were just pushing the same material. Well, you can't tell a contractor how to do anything or else you own it as an agency. So the superintendent of the paving, the general contractor came by and I said to the inspector, I said, watch this. And they had a brand new 140 cat blade set down. And I said to him, boy, that's a brand new motor grader. And he said, yeah, we just, this first job it's been on. And he walks away and he comes back by and I said to him, I says, you got an operator for that blade? Oh yeah. And he walks by. And the third time he came by and I said, well, is the guy getting paid? And he said, yeah. And he turned around and he said, should I be blading it? And I said, it's up to you. And he finally figured it out. And as soon as they bladed it, then it walked out. But yeah, back and forth until it's, uh, till it walks out. Final compaction is a combination of nuclear or pneumatic and steel rollers. Check with the nuclear gauge. So last time I looked at min dot spec, the goal was 95% of modified Proctor from mixed design. Some other states I worked in, it was 95% of modified Proctor ran on the site. And that's a, that's a good spec, so. Cover of wearing course, fog seal or tack before surfacing HMA. Use what is, 
needed for the expected traffic loadings, use the recommended PG grade binder. So here in Minnesota, MnDOT's position is on new construction, a minus 34 for the low temperature oil or binder. I would tell you if you're doing stabilized full depth or you're just doing regular full depth, you need to look at that as the same as new construction because you're completely breaking the crack pattern up. Use the proper binder to go to the expense of stabilizing or grinding up and then use a minus 28. You're probably just fooling yourself. So chip seal has been used on low volume roads, recommend a double chip seal. So here's just a picture. They're doing a pre-grind on the road. And this contractor is bringing three of them out and you'll see they've got a pad foot working. So this is just this, uh, right now they're doing the FDR. And I don't know whether this project got stabilized or not, but they're starting their compactive effort immediately. So this road here had already been pre-ground like we've seen in the previous picture. And now they're injecting the emulsion in there. And this contractor does what I think is a good job. So this front reclaimer is pushing the tanker and injecting. And normally if it's 24 foot road, they'll figure out how far a quarter of the tanker load will go. So let's say you got 6,000 gallons in it and, uh, and a quarter of it is 1,500 gallons and 1,500 gallons will go 1,000 feet. I'm just pulling numbers out of the air. So they'll push down 1,000, back up, and they'll push all the way across so they're matched up so the grader and the pad foots can work together. But they're doing a second mix there because what can happen depend on the reclaimer when you inject the emulsion in, you can end up, if you only use the front reclaimer, you can end up with a bottom layer is a little heavier on emulsion because it settles in the bottom of the teeth. So what this contractor was doing with they're injecting six inches or stabilizing six inches. So he set his machine up so that when it was five inches deep, this front machine, this front machine, he set it up so when it was five inches deep, the machine thought it was going six inches deep. So it's putting all the emulsion in for six inches. And then this other machine is coming by at six inches and picking it up and they get a nice uniform deal. Now, my understanding is the new working machines have and I'm assuming the cats do too, but they've changed their mixing chambers to where they can do it in one pass. But if I was inspecting a job and I had any question, as soon as they got going, I'd get a shovel out there and start to dig down after they've injected the emulsion in and see if it's got a fat layer on the bottom. If it does, I'd tell them, what are you gonna do to fix it? And let them come up with the answer. So here's a picture of Padfoot working on the road until it walks out. <clears throat> motor grader. This motor grader can make or break your project. So on this road here, we wanted to stabilize 24 feet. You need to have flags or something along the edge there because if the motor grader operator isn't careful, that 24 feet will become 26 feet. They'll widen it out. And when they widen it out, if we had designed the pavement for six inches stabilized with X amount of HMA to carry the loads. And if all of a sudden we widen the road out from 24 feet, the stabilized part from 24 feet to 26 or 28 feet, we thinned up how much we stabilize. Now we're under design for our road. So we need to watch it. I grew up in Western Illinois and I worked for a township down there and rock was very uh, lacking. We would probably, in farming 800 to 1,000 acres of crops a year, we'd probably pick up two or three rocks a year. <clears throat> the joke was if we were going to have a rock fight when we were kids, you had to bring your own rock, and once you threw it, you picked it back up. But I learned on a motor grader on gravel roads how to keep the material in and stuff. But So watch the motor grader there. Here they're hitting it with a rubber-tired roller, and now we're checking it with the nuclear density gauge there. So some other uses for FDR. Whoops. Used to upgrade low 
gravel roads to dust-free, lightly surface, low-volume roadways, many surface options, HMA, double chip seal, microsurfacing. Can be used as a strong base for upgrade when traffic increases. <clears throat> so this job here, this was a county close to the cities, and this was back in 2004, I believe, or five. Um, they were growing. It was a about 50 miles from the city. And uh, this gravel road really needed to be paved. But they knew the way the growth was with development coming out in these cornfields in the future that it needed to be an urban section, curb, and gutter. And the county engineer did not want to spend the money, couldn't afford to spend the money to update the urban section, didn't want to spend a lot of money to put four and a half, five inches of hot mix down there. So <clears throat> we proposed coming in on this gravel and it was a good gravel road and injecting emulsion in the top six inches, stabilizing that and then putting three inches HMA on it. And <clears throat> it's performing very well, excuse me. So here's the case where they're, they're doing the double mix process. Uh, here's the pad foot working on it. You can, there. This was one of the roads where I had to get on a blade operator because about right there where my arrows, that's where the 24 foot mark was. And they were slopping material out the outside. I forgot I had that old ranger. And here's another picture showing the front one. And you see this fat area here? That tends to be on the outside edge of the reclaimers when you do it in one pass too. And here's just another picture to see how much more uniform it looks. And this was taken about three or four days after we did the stabilization, but before it was paved and it's raining and you'll see it's shedding, it's been fog sealed and it's shedding water real well. So, so any questions, uh, full depth reclamation. To me, it's an underutilized tool. And here's a picture of where they're working in a curb and gutter section. So, would you always fog seal on top of the SFDR before paving? Yes, for a couple of reasons, especially if it's going to be open to traffic for a while. I want to waterproof it and I don't want it to ravel or help with the raveling. And second, it helps uh, adhere the uh, HMA to the, to the uh, stabilized material. North Dakota and South Dakota, they prime all their gravel, whether it's stabilized or not, before they before they pave on it. And their crack pattern in my travels is greatly diminished compared to our crack patterns. So and that was something that MnDOT I tried to push, but I you can only win what battles you can win. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to talk about hot in place or HIR, and I've got very limited experience. So basically, I'm just going to introduce you to it. Uh, go to the barn, uh, get a hold of Dustrol or Gallagher, and talk to them. So there's three methods. There's uh, I call this the heat and scarify method. This is the heat multiple heating units, mill and relay. And then the, this one here, heat with multiple units. You'll see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight heating units and three milling there. And this is a remixing plant. So the difference between this one here is they just heat it up and they grind it up and they lay it back out with the emulsion or the rejuvenator added to it. This one here, my understanding, they can add new hot mix into it there. And I've, I have never been around this third method. So, so here's the one process that I have been around and you see it was 2010. So it's been a while since there, but basically they've got two heating units and then they scarify it with what I call field cultivator tines. So they're heating it up 
and they're scarifying it and then they're putting the rejuvenating agent on here and they've got a, a screed to lay it back out and just some more pictures and this one here you'll see they end up with a, a windrow of material here's their additives and they're picking the material up and resizing it and stuff and here's just another picture of remember there was three of those on the second one or, or there were there was a three milling process on the one i'm showing and here they they each mill as a heat you know they got the preheaters and then they heat and then they mill up so much and they windrow it and so then the next one comes and heats and heats the the areas where there no there's no millings piled and then they move the pile around and scrape it in there and it, it's a pretty neat process there so you can see it's been heat preheated and it's being milled there on the first pass and there they're injecting their rejuvenating additives to it and this is the back end of the process and just some more pictures so construction details the scarify method inch inch and a half max uh, other methods can go up to two and a half inches maybe three uh, added a type of amount should be dependent determined by the uh, mixed design method check depth of recycling hourly check temperature cross paving pass at hourly check your cross slope and check density and this is what you end up with uh it's a good process uh i know that one of the northern counties uses it quite a bit uh it works it does crack i mean my biggest reason why i'm a cold person is because anytime you reheat the asphalt up you're aging it and the more you age it the uh more brittle it becomes i know they got rejuvenators and stuff there but there but when you do uh cold in place you're doing it at the ambient temperature so is there any questions Well, I want to thank you and uh, you've got my contact information and stuff and I'll be perfectly honest with you. Uh, CIR and FDR and cold central plant. I've got a, a real passion. I think the hot in place recycling has its place. I just haven't got as much experience on that. So all I was trying to do was just to introduce you to it. Uh, I have my opinions. Hopefully, I'm be be proven wrong. But uh, to me, stabilized full depth reclamation is way underutilized. Cold in place recycling is way underutilized. Uh, and as cold central plant becomes more available, hopefully, it's not going to be underutilized. Hello, Tom. One more question. Would you do a uh, a uh, fog seal over the top of a CIR before putting the, the new pavement layer down? Yes, I would. In fact, uh, maybe I skipped over it. I, you know, I'm getting old. Uh, when I worked for Coke Materials, we were put, uh, promoting CIR and helping support them. We would always tell them to fog it two or three days after it had been place just to help with raveling and help shed water and then it also helps with the bonding of there so i'm a bit i'm a big fan that if i was in charge of min dot that anytime we were paving on gravel it would be fog sealed or prime too just because i want to try uh, stop any moisture that's underneath from being able to get up against the bottom of the hot mix and the reason why I say that when I started corn for uh, Coke materials for these uh, mix designs for SFDR and CIR, every once in a while, 
you know, because you'd be corn and you'd take core out and the bottom of the core would be rotten, you know, you, we've all seen it. And every once in a while you come to a road and the bottom of the cores were perfectly flat and they had this stinky stuff, you know, smelled a little bit like diesel fuel. So we started hand auger and we found out that they'd been primed. And a lot of these roads would have been primed or else they were road mix, one of the two, but they'd been done in the 50s and yet the bottom layer of the asphalt was still perfectly smooth. And that, and that really tweaked my entrance on priming or fog sealing over these in place recycling. That, to me, it all correlates well. And so I found a study that uh, uh, Dwayne Blankenship, former Crow Wing County engineer, is retired now, hopefully still alive, did back in the early 60s where they looked at the value of priming over gravel. And they said it was very valuable, but the problem was the materials they were using in those days, you had to let it sit for two or three weeks before you could pave on it. And the contractors were in too big a rush. So it was a case of, we had a good process, but we threw the baby out with the bath water. So, but no, to answer your question, I would, whether it's CIR, FDR or SFDR, I would, I would definitely fog seal it at the pro appropriate time before I paved it. Great Thank question. You that. Thank you for that info. Some contractors say that when you CIR, the, the CIR needs to set up for a while before you can pave over it. Is that a lack of compaction or is there a truth to that? Well, let me tell you, uh, a gentleman named Doug Hansen, Arizona DOT, I think now he's working part-time. He's a few years older than me, so, but he was the godfather of cold and place recycling. And Arizona was one of the early states to do it because they had a lot of uh, block cracking from the environmental deal. And so he was up here on another research project that Asphalt Institute was doing with MnDOT. And we went out for supper. And so we're sitting there chatting, Doug and I are. And I said, Doug, where'd this 2% moisture less number come from? I've been told you're the godfather of cold in place recycling. And Doug said, well, you know, he says, uh, we had to have a number. And I said, what do you mean we had to have a number? He said, yeah, you know, he said, engineers need a number. They need something to measure. So he said, we're working out in the desert, the High Plains desert. And he said, two days afterward, he said, we're always below 2%. So we put in, it ought to be below 2%. He said, have you guys got that up here in Minnesota? And I said, yeah. He said, well, how do you get the roads that dry? You guys get a ton of moisture. And he was the one to turn me on to the idea that if you got proper density, uniform density, you can pave on it earlier. Now, California has done studies with emulsion where that the, they, they basically take the moisture requirement out, but we're paving it today. We do the compaction. We meet our 95% of modified proctor, whatever the spec is. And then let's say two days from now, we're going to pave it. They make the contractor come back and re-roll it. <clears throat> and it's as simple as two or three passes with a steel roller and a rubber tired roller right before they pave it. And what they found is their weight per cubic foot goes up two or three pounds between the initial day of rolling and re-rolling it right before they pay. And so that would be something I would look at too. And I think if it, if it works for, for uh, emulsion, you probably ought to look at it for foam because if you, back when we could write on contractors equipment before MnDOT's policy said there, I watched on a job where half of it was foamed and half of it was emulsion. And I was riding on the mill, and as soon as they switched over to foam, they increased the amount of water they put at the cutter head on the mill from where they've been running on the emulsion. I asked him why, and he said, well, we need so much total liquid to get the material through the paver. <clears throat> and so whether I'm adding the water in the emulsion or I'm adding it to the milling head, water is water. That's my take. So if you uh, do that uh, fog seal, does that kind of um, put a longer time for that that water content to go down or that moisture content to no, go down. No, because what happens on the on the fog seal, it's not totally impermeable. You're only shooting a 
eight hundredths to a tenth of a gallon of CSS 1H. So basically what it's doing is working a little bit like Tyvek on your house. If it rains, it allows, it doesn't allow the water to come through, you know, liquid water, but any water vapor in it, it's able to percolate up through it. Thank you for that information. No problem. Thank you for the questions. Well, Claire, if we don't have any more questions, I want to thank everybody for your time. And uh, my new role at Aztec is just to share information like we're doing here. Uh, no sales pitch. So if you got a road and you don't know what to do with or something unique that you've never seen before, I'd love to come and see it. So just give me a call or send me an email. I'm I'm free. The price is free. So thank you, Tom. You bet. And I apologize, we're, we're done a little early, but I told Claire, I, my youngest granddaughter was coming over and I, it would have been a handful to, 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 with her, she would have been asked, what is that grandpa, what is that? So. <laughs> well, thank okay, you, well, I'm gonna end the meeting now, but thanks again. You bet.